Anyway, today I wanted to talk about uh, Shin Gi Tai and training it. Um, what does that mean? Well, of course, Shin Gi Tai, mind, technique, and body. And each of those has specific ways to train it. And that's what I wanted to address today, is just look at some of those um, ways that we can deal with that. First of all, before I start, thank you, Patreon. Um, my Patreon family has really made an unbelievable difference through this COVID. And now that New South Wales, Victoria, most of Australia is locked down. Queensland's lucky, but we're literally right from here. Two kilometres south is the uh, New South Wales border. So at any time it could change for us. And the Patreon support uh, has made a world of difference. So thank you very much. Uh, YouTube, don't forget, um, if you're new, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you to like and subscribe, but like and subscribe and leave a thumbs up and a message and tell the world how much you're enjoying this and that'll help to uh, grow the channel. Uh, but anyway, thanks for coming, guys. Look, first of all, let's go through the, the idea of the Shin Gi Tai. Shin, the mind, has a number of different facets, of course. First of all, uh, there's willpower and willpower drives everything. Uh, every word, thought and action is, first of all, driven by an act of will. If I pick up a book, put it down, it's the willpower, the electrical energy from the brain. Oh, it's Chrissy. Good to see you, man. Uh, turns into mechanical energy. I pick it up. So everything starts with willpower. And that's why it's really important. So also, I was so adamant all the time that training is primarily about developing the willpower. And that, that manifests in different ways, such as determination, uh, courage, things like that. Okay. And um, one good way to train the willpower, first of all, is constantly challenge yourself with new things. So also, I used to say, if you're given a choice between doing something easy and hard, always take the hard way because that's how you develop your willpower. If you constantly take the easy way, you're not pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. And that is the secret key. Optimal growth happens a little bit outside your comfort zone. Maximal growth happens way out of your comfort zone, but it's too much sometimes. So it's very important now that we understand there's a big difference between optimal training and maximal training. You you. There are times when you have to train maximally, but the real objective is to train optimally. Ian King, who's a good friend of mine, um, and he's a, a strength and conditioning coach. That's Ian right there, actually. He and I went to the same high school, same uh, university. And he's written a number of books, and this is one of them. And this particular book, have a good look at it, I think is perhaps one of the best books you can get on, on physical preparation, Foundations of Physical Preparation, uh, and uh, by Ian King. It's really, really worthwhile looking at. But Ian was the one that introduced me to the idea that it's important to understand there's a difference between optimal and maximal outcomes. The optimal training, the best way to describe it is as Ian puts it, he puts it slightly different and the only reason it puts it different is because I can't remember it verbatim so I just paraphrase it but Ian points out that train today so that tomorrow's training can be the best it can be so if you under bake it today tomorrow's training can't receive the full benefit if you over bake it today you're burnt out so write that down train today so that tomorrow's training can be the best it can be. Of course, there are times when you really want to smash it and you want to test your willpower, test your courage and things like that, you know, but just be prepared for a few days rest afterwards. Well, she unsheathed your book very hard to put down. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for buying it. Also, it becomes a matter of identification. Um, I had a good long chat with a mate today and do I, we identify with our weaker self, the way we identify with the part of us which feels constantly limiting and constantly uh, uh, undervalued? Or do we say we have this infinite potential? And a lot of the time, it's just that identification. And one way to do that is with affirmations. The the best known one, and every everyone knows, is every day and every way I'm getting better. And you can just say that to yourself, even when you screw things up, 
every day and every way I'm getting better. And, an, and another good way to constantly develop that uh, willpower and affirm that you have uh, everything you need is to constantly challenge high quality techniques and keep at it, keep at it until uh, you get mastery of that particular technique. Uh, of course, meditation is vital. Uh, it's always a challenge to talk about meditation because some people think it's a lot of kafuha. Um, and the thing with meditation too is that it's so subtle that you don't really appreciate the effect it's having over time. It's a little bit like seeing your friend's child after a few years. You go, no, that can't be the same kid. Or it's a little bit like training daily, working well, keep training away, and then one day you run into somebody who stopped training a year ago and you train together, and the difference in your quality with theirs is mind-blowing. So it's only when you see that uh, over time that makes a difference. So meditation is really, really valuable, but it's also important to remember that the type of meditation is very key. A lot of, med what, a lot of things that people call meditation today aren't really meditation. They're simply forms of concentration, which is fine. To be able to meditate, you, be able to, you need to be able to concentrate on a single point with an unbroken uh, flow. And meditation is a very specific form of single-pointed focus. You know, in Kyokushin, Saul so used to say, just have the courage to step forward. He was always adamant. Step forward, you give yourself a chance. Step back, you, uh, you'll always be overcome. I mean, athletes have won Wimbledon at 17 years old. Matsui was uh, winning tournaments and competing at the top level at 17, 18 years old. I wasn't like that. I wasn't particularly athletic. I was just stubborn. Uh, and when I went to Hombu, to me, every day was a real a real challenge. As a 17-year-old boy, you're getting whacked and boom. It was a real challenge, but I swore to myself that I would, every time I was at Hombu, would never miss a day. So I just, even though I didn't like it, I would go back. And what happens is, of course, you realize that the thing you fear most ended up not really being worth fearing anyway. And then, like I said, you don't notice the big change. But I went back to the country where I was living because... I, um, I was living a little bit out of Tokyo and there was a, a dojo there that I was training back at. And when I go to Hombu, then come back, the difference was crazy. They're going, whoa. And then I came back to Australia and I went away as this little boy and I came back a man. And, and really, I developed a different level of courage. So that's part of the shin, the mind training as well. Another important thing is attitude. That's another factor of uh, the mind, shin. You know, and uh, it's an ongoing process. It, it takes time. It, it's And here's the thing. As long as you're in the dual world, as long as you're alive in the flesh and blood body, you are, you are um, subject to that body. So the attitude training never stops. Every single day, in every single way, you can constantly work on improving. Just when you think you got it together. I remember uh, the Dalai Lama came and talked in Brisbane, went and talked and he said something along the lines of, if you think little things don't bother you, try walking around all day with a pebble in your shoe. And that'll test how, how really well uh, you are above all that stuff. So the, the, the attitude constantly needs to be uh, worked on. Okay, there's an old saying, the deeper the mud, the bigger the Buddha. And what that means is we really learn from our life challenges. So that's why we need to be grateful. We're grateful for everything that comes. We're grateful for everything that doesn't come because um, it all serves as grist for the mill, as they say, to develop our, uh, our the right attitude. If that's all you're doing. It's the right attitude. Uh, you know, um, I think the right attitude is we live here in the world, but don't be too subject to it. Don't be thrown around by the fluctuations which are inevitable. Be in the world, but not of it. Okay? So... Obviously, there's a thousand different ways that you can approach training the mind. But in karate, just remember that under pressure, you need to constantly challenge your fear. You need to constantly push yourself just outside the comfort zone. And when you feel like stopping, just take two more steps. When you feel like you can't take another breath, just take one more breath. Everything comes down. 
everything is spaced in terms of the length and uh, value of a single breath. Okay, so the next level, of course, is uh, gi or technique. And fundamentally, for technique, there are just about three fundamental things which I think um, are really, really valuable. The first rule is in learning mastery, technique mastery, is break it down into bite-sized bits. Even the fundamental front kick is a series of movements that connect together to create the kick. And so uh, you need to break it down and drill those small bits and then put them together. So we, we follow that process. We'll break it down. Even if you follow one, one section of it over and over and over, um, and then you put it back together. For example, oh, I've been sitting in Cesar. My legs are asleep. Let's see if I can. So what I might mean is, don't laugh at me, Sean. I'm the same. I'm exactly the same. <laughs> um, what I mean is when you're working a drill, let's say you want to work something as simple as a front kick. Okay? What's a front kick? All right, you've got the movement of the body. Do you move your leg or do you move your arm? How do you overcome telegraphic motion? How do you disguise it? How do I optimize that snap so that I'm not relying on strength, I'm relying on speed because there's a big difference between the two. So maybe it's like one, one, there, one, and then one, and then one, and then one, one. And maybe you'll even leave it out because one thing we tend to do when we train uh, to develop speed and power on the kick is we want to make sure the body weight is falling into the kick. So you might go and fall into the kick just from there. So you work on that idea of making sure that the body weight is correct. Then it's the hip. It's a hip movement without too much of a telegraphic motion or it's a fake fake, fake, and you push it. So you've got to get that hip movement and don't over bake it. Don't, you're not trying to drive the target 20 feet away. You're trying to impact the target with maximal uh, velocity because it's that, uh, that explosiveness which makes all the difference. So you break it down. What is the movement? One, one, two. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Rotate off the angle. So if Sean stands here. Sean's my target. Okay, here's my target. One. I don't want to just kick and come back to the dead zone because he pops me in the face. Okay, what I need to do is add the ex exit as part of the drill. So, one, one. Maybe you can add footwork because you can't stand here. If I can stand here and kick him, he can stand here and kick me. So, an extra step may be moving that, moving around, or countering. I like to do it off a counter. But then we're here, one, two, one, two, three. And after I throw the kick, put the foot down, and move off the target. I need to get out of the dead zone. One, two, three, put my foot down, rotate off. So that becomes part of the drill. So how many steps is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and come back. So you need to break them down. Maybe you're doing really well with that, sorry. Maybe you're doing really well with that part, okay? But you're not doing so well with getting out of the dead zone. So you drill that part over and over. You find out which way it works best for you. So that works well with me. One, put the foot down, split off to the side. So, thanks, Sean. So you see by breaking it down into bite-sized chunks, it allows you to master those little bits and then you put them back together again. Good point. You always try to get your kick back faster than you got it out. That's 100%. Um, okay, so that's the first rule of thumbs of de for developing good technique is break it down into bite-sized chunks, okay? 
The next thing is the finer the detail, the clearer the process. That's very, very important. You have to have every detail correct. If at any stage your instructor says, where are your hands in that situation and you can't answer, then you need to go deeper into the detail. The finer the detail, the clearer the process. And you have to, we, we call them Star Wars clones, right? In the dojo, we call them Star Wars clones. You have to be like a Star Wars clone. Why? Because they do everything exactly the same. So if the technique requires that this hand moves like that, you have to move it like that. It's not arbitrary. Nothing is arbitrary when you're developing skills. So you have to be like a Star Wars clone, do everything exactly the same. It becomes even more valuable when you're grappling. For example, if I'm here with Sean and I want to do a choke, well, the choke requires that I get my hand up here, put my finger on the label of his gi, create a fist, straighten my wrist. That's the first thing. Now... I may come here, or I may even loop over there, or come in underneath here. Again, making my fingers touch behind. One, two. Straighten my wrists, and if I squeeze that on. A lot of hard work to get it working. But look what happens when I just add one thing, which is simply change angle. Look at the difference. And I cross my heart. I'm not squeezing any harder, am I? No. I'm here, square. I have my hands in the right position. So I've got the first few steps correct. One, hand goes up, finger on label. Squeeze into a fist, straighten the wrist. Two, hand goes under. And there's different ways. I'm not saying that. There's lots of different ways to choke. Hand goes under, fingertips touch behind, make a fist. Three, Three is optimize the angle. But I'm a dill. I've left that out. So now I try and squeeze it on and I use my strength. And, and eventually I get it and I go, yeah. But Sean's going, eh, yeah, maybe. Okay. So one, hand in. Two, there. My hands are in position. Now I break it down. The finer the detail, the clearer the process. I have to be clear about the steps. I add that one step which is slight angle change, and the tap goes on instantly. So if you don't behave like a Star Wars clone and do everything exactly the same, you will, you will sometimes miss out on the fine detail that makes a difference. So the finer the detail, the clearer the process. Okay, and the next thing is, straight out of uh, Mark Wahlberg and the shooter, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Well, I had a friend who's one of our Kyokushin black belts who was training the SAS, and he said they spent hours working on how to draw the gun without even having a gun. Brad Hansen there, he's a firearms instructor. He'll probably concur. I hope he does. Otherwise, I'm going to look silly. But you can't just walk out to the range and go bang, 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 bang. You have to get the neurological pathway. So slow is smooth. You get smooth. You get smooth. And then you increase the tempo. This is why working with a metronome is good. You start off with that rhythm, ba, 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 and then you, you, you increase it over time. And, and so by having that slow is smooth, smooth is fast, you develop the correct rhythm and the correct timing. Uh, and rhythm and timing, the same thing, really. Um, rhythm is within you, timing is in relation to someone else. But you've got to have the balance the relaxation, the accuracy, that timing and the speed. And over time, you increase that according to uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And like I just said, BRATS, the, the acronym BRATS, very important. We use that. Balance, relaxation, accuracy, timing and speed. And I say relaxation because timing is actually rhythm as well. The word Musashi uses in five rings when he says there is timing and everything is exactly the same word when you talk about rhythm. Okay, so balance, relaxation, accuracy, timing, and speed are the key fundamentals to develop any skill, starting with slow is smooth, smooth is fast.
acronym. So BRATS is what the acronym you use to develop the skills within you. BALD BRATS is the acronym that you use when you're working with a partner. So the BALD BRATS is your, your breathing. You have to be very conscious of your breath because if your breathing is wrong, they'll hit you and knock you out right with that good timing. The breathing, the angles, the leverage, and the distance. So everything you do with these seven stages of Kumite, of course, is aimed towards mastering those uh, fundamental skills. Um, but another really important point is when you're, when you're working on skills, try not to rely on your natural gifts, your natural physical gifts. So if you're particularly flexible, don't try to make things work by using your flexibility. If you're stronger than normal, don't rely on using that strength to compensate for poor technique. It's really important that you let your natural um, gifts come later on and use them, but don't use them when you're learning the skill. Otherwise, you cheat. And it's like this. If I was doing that choke and I didn't get the angle, but I'm immensely strong, I'll still make it work. And I'll get away with that for an awful long time until one day I'm up against someone who knows a little bit more than I do and that choke isn't going to work at all. It's the same with a front kick. You, you, you apply too much strength with the front kick and you get away with it in the dojo because you're 110 Ks and everyone else is 70 Ks. And then one day somewhere you're, you're in a tournament and all of a sudden guys don't fall down so easy from your front, front kick because you've never focused on mastering the proper technical flow you've relied on your strengths so it's good to have physical gifts probably every athlete in the olympics has gifts now tai the physical the shingi tai tai physical another way of saying tai in japanese is karada that means the body so the shingi tai tai is about the physical conditioning there are four primary somatics in the body a somatic is simply a physical property the four major somatics are flexibility, speed, cardiovascular endurance, and strength. And all other physical qualities, whether it's agility or muscular endurance or these, they're all subsets of those four somatics. Four somatics. Flexibility, strength, cardiovascular endurance, and, uh, and speed. I call, I, have, I call them S's. I have a thing called the S14, which is a series of things where each one starts with S. And in the in the physical attributes, you have suppleness, which is flexibility, stamina, suppleness, stamina, strength, speed. Now, for the martial arts, and particularly for uh, martial arts involving uh, heavy-duty impact, not just martial arts, any, any impact sport like rugby league and so on, you have another one which I call sturdiness. So it's the fifth somatic. I refer to it as the fifth somatic. And that requires, uh, there are different ways that you can train that as well. So to train your other areas, for example, flexibility, the primary way to improve your flexibility is through long-term static flexibility. Even though the movements that we have are very uh, mobile, the best way it's been proven that the best way to improve your flexibility is through time spent in static flexibility. You just can't beat it. The other thing, too, is that all four somatics impact on the other in different ways. And flexibility impacts on the other more than any other. For example, you look at the Olympics. Go back and look at some of the video of, for example, the guys in the hurdles or the sprinters or even the marathon, and you look at their running style and the length of their stride and the shape of their stride where their they front foot lifts all the way up so that the, the leg is actually horizontal and the knee drives forward, that's all impacted by flexibility. And if you're tight, you have tight um, hip adductors and um, hip flexors, what's going to happen is it will affect the way you can express your speed, the way you can express your strength and so on. And it will fatigue you even faster, you know. And then if you if you want to do a little bit of research, look up ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and its role it plays in the production of energy. It, it drives 
so many processes of the body, including the muscle um, contraction and even uh, um, nerve impulse. And, and it has a huge effect on um, uh, your ability to maintain performance over time without suffering um, uh, breakdown. So in many respects, you could even see the whole process of training as how to best optimize the abilities the body's ability to uh, use and replenish ATP is very, very important. Yeah, it's good to understand the different muscle types. There's fundamentally three muscle types. There, there's fast twitch and slow twitch. There's two different fast twitch. All, all this sort of stuff is so fascinating. And this, is, this book here is highly recommended, Foundations of Physical Preparation by Ian King, goes into... Well, here we go. Look, I just opened this one page by coincidence. Neuromuscular system. The neuromuscular system consists of nerves and muscles. Fiber type. Muscle fibers are categorized into, generally speaking, fast twitch or slow twitch. The characteristics of these two types of muscle fibers are shown in the following table. So there you go. And he goes right in and see that table there where he talks about contraction speed, power output, endurance, aerobic enzymes, anaerobic enzymes, and fatigue resistance and then he gives which ones best are necessary to train uh, this is a really fantastic little book it's not a big book but it's solid gold oh here we go look physical pro i just flicked open another page again and i honestly haven't looked at this book for a long time um i've got here in my own handwriting karate somatic psychological strategic and skills. So Shingi Tai, but you've also got the strategy of skill. And I opened it up here. It talks about physical preparation. Look, speed, strength, endurance, flexibility. How about that? The four semantics that we were just talking about. Great little book. Another really good book, a really important book. And one thing that people, Bobby Lowe used to say, and uh, Oishi Shihan also said, people have no idea how fast Solsai was. He was so fast, it was insane. And they talk about Bruce Lee being fast. Bruce Lee was super fast, but he was also 56 kilograms or something. Solsai was 80 kilograms and blindingly fast. So speed kills in the martial arts. The speed of the lightweight is what the heavyweight needs to work towards. So we always say this is worth thinking about. As a heavyweight, train like a lightweight because the lightweight qualities are what you want to achieve. As a lightweight, train like a heavyweight because the heavyweight qualities are what you want to achieve. And this is a really good book. I brought this along too. This goes, I've had this for years. Warrior Speed, okay, by Ted Wyman. Great book. When I was younger, when I was preparing for tournaments, I used to do, for example, downhill sprints. And I'd find a slope which was just maybe two degrees downhill not more than that because it's too steep you'd fall over but by having a slope which was just fractionally below horizontal it would force your body to sprint even faster than it normally would would it wake up fast twitch fiber well, i guess some people would say yes some people would say no but what it did was it would improve your neurological firing system so that um, under pressure you could move even quicker it's like working with um rather than hitting the bag heavy, uh, working with, with the speed ball and things like that and working with mitts. Now, the fifth somatic, which we talk about, uh, is what I call sturdiness, of course. And if you have a look at the 50, Core 54, if you're a, a Patreon family member, you will have received the Core 54. Uh, and I have included in the Core 54 five fundamental conditioning uh, techniques that you need, methods that you need. Of course, there's Makiwara. So Makiwara training will condition your hand. And then there's Makiwara shin work to condition your shins. It's really important that you understand you're not just conditioning the front of the shin. You want to condition your foot the side of the shin. If you've ever fought a tournament and thrown a kick and had really hard shins but still got cracked because your kick was 
one inch off or his block was not what you expected, then you understand why it's really important that you don't just chain a train the part of the shin that you're going to kick with. You also have to train the part of the shin that can get hit accidentally in the process. So you use the sandbag. This is our sandbag, which we use instead of the makiwara. If you want to use the, the traditional makiwara, that's okay. I always found that to be a little too time consuming in terms of maintenance. You put it in the backyard and setting it up, if you set it up really, really, really well and look after it properly, then it's low maintenance. But to make sure that it maintains its um, its condition, you know, most people are too lazy to get it right, which means probably me as well. But these are just bags that I stitched these bags up myself, just drilled some holes through that aluminium and bolted it through and hung it on this frame. This frame was a gift to us. I believe you can buy them. But if not, before we had this frame, uh, we used to use just scaffolding. You make a, an A-frame out of scaffolding. I, I, have a look at the video. I've got a, a specific hand conditioning video on my YouTube channel. But essentially, it's not about developing big knuckles. It's about strengthening the hand. So it means you have to work the knife hand. You have to work the back fist. You have to work the palm heel. Then you have to work the ridge hand. But each of those, if it's done incorrectly, you'll expose the incorrect technique with excessive tension in the shoulder, uh, that sort of thing. So follow that video. There's a whole process of building up with the hands here, back fist, ridge hand, palm heel, and then, of course, you finish off with the fist. But the thing about the fist is you, you end up doing less of the fist than everything else because uh, it's very important that you understand it's strengthening the hand. It's not about creating calluses. The calluses are just a byproduct. Now, if you have a look down below, there you see this is what we use for our shin. It's really important. I've seen guys sit there with a the shin. They open a magazine and they're just going, this sort of thing. It's not what you need to do. You need to focus, kick, focus, kick, focus, kick. And you, you make sure that you condition not just the front of the shin, but all around the side and everything because that sort of thing, you're kicking the side because that's the area which will end up uh, getting damaged in a tournament. And remember, I don't know about these days, but in the old days, the world tournament went for three days. So if you didn't get that conditioning right, quite often you'd have to pull out from injury. People would pull out from injury. Some of my best fights are against guys I didn't fight because they had to pull out of, uh, of the tournament with, uh, as a result of injury. Now, they're the first two of the five sturdiness drills. The first two are one-man drills. The first one is the hand makiwara. The second one is the shin conditioning. I'm going to go through with Sean now. I appreciate Sean coming along today. Show you a couple more. So let's find the about there. Good. So the first drill that we need is actually a drill from wrestling. And the reason it's so good is it develops, it conditions your body against certain types of impact, but it also teaches you the skill of correct uh, um, power generation through the hips. So this is called a pummel. We're square, our feet are square, and we just put one arm under. Then we swim under with the other hand. Swim under with the other hand. Then we focus on good posture, make sure our eyes stay straight ahead. And I just look over Sean's neck and we pummel. Pummel, pummel, pummel. Notice one hand goes under, this one kind of holds the elbow. I don't lift up and pummel in, lift up, pummel in. I scissor my arm. So this works the underhook drill. 
okay? Now, the impact point is the front of the chest, but the power is generated from the hips. So in other words, I don't want to do this. Like that. I'm using my hips. This is level one with the feet squared. Then what you do is we switch my feet so that when the right hand goes under, my right foot comes in. So back and forward, back, forward, back, forward. You can see you start to get that impact, but it has nothing to do with popping the chest in. It's all about learning to generate the power off the hips. So that pummel exercise is vital. If you're not sure how to do it, uh, look for a wrestling school or look it up on the internet. The important thing to remember is right hand, right foot between his feet. It goes between his feet. So if you look straight on, you see my foot. Just turn around a bit. My foot is between his feet. We switch between his feet. Right hand, right foot, left hand, left foot. And it's about the hip movement like this. It's not about the chest movement. Okay. The second two-man drill that you should work on is simply you stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe, left foot forward or right foot forward in a fighting stance. And you make sure that your toes are in alignment. You don't want to be back here. You want to get close enough. And remember, <clears throat> start off slowly and build up. It's the same with strength conditioning. If you want to do weights, start off very slowly. In fact, science has even proven that for a beginner, one good session a week is more all you need to start to, to get the benefits of, of the strengthening. Don't try and train every day. It comes down to optimized training. Remember, you train today so that tomorrow's session will be the best it can be. With weights especially, if you do it wrong, you're going to hurt yourself. Okay? Well, it's the same with this. I have my foot together, and I don't come in and try and snap my opponent's, my partner's um, ribs. I start off soft. So, Sean hits me left, right, left, and I hit him. One, two, three. One, two, three. We used to do this with the tournament fighters until one of them dropped from being winded. So what would happen is, in tournaments, no one could hurt them. Literally, Wally Schnaubel, in our dojo, no one ever dropped him. And we, we'd hang the fighters off the chin-up bar, and the whole dojo could come up and just go, and they have three shots, and no one ever dropped um, Wally Schnaubel. So when he went on to fight people like Sam Greco and go five extensions, Sam said to me later, he, he knows when he's penetrated and he just didn't penetrate, nothing penetrated. So that's the, the first one is one, two, three, and then he hits one, two, three. Then the next one is simultaneous. So we start together, left hand first, ready, itch, knee, some, itch. And that's a really good conditioning exercise as well. So that's the fourth one. Hand makiwara, shin conditioning, pummels, and two-man punch drill. The next one is the leg conditioning. So I take my stance and good posture, and Sean kicks me. One, two, three, four. It develops a couple of things. First of all, it develops a sense of distance. Secondly, it develops a sense of angle. Thirdly, it conditions your legs. So, of course, if I wanted to, shin, Sean kicks, I could just jam my knee straight into his shin, and that's the end of the drill. I've got no partner and he's got no shin. That's not what we're doing. I turn my leg, get used to turning the leg at the correct angle, so when it comes in at this angle, I always want to make sure that my leg, if the, if the kick is coming in this angle, my leg turns so that it's 100% directly in line with that angle. So if he kicks softly, and I don't move my leg, I wear it on the side. That's the idea of timing the kick so that your opponent can't get the check out properly. You time it so that the, the leg gets kicked like this. And you know it works because the head goes to the point of injury. So the drill teaches, first of all, to turn my leg out. One, 
So I start to condition my legs all round. I can do it again so that I don't turn as much and get that conditioning, but I need to develop the distance and the angle. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Then I go. One, two, three, four. You do it at the level your partner wants. So if it's going too soft, you say up it. Go. Harder, harder. Not that hard. <laughs> okay, so you work with your partner to right, right, find the right level. Level two, he kicks. I counter with the opposite leg. He kicks. The idea of this is to teach you that in a tournament you create an impression, so the time to respond and counter is straight away. If someone kicks you, you kick them straight back. So, um, let's start again, one. So level two, I kick with the opposite leg. Where you kick is determined by distance more than anything else. Okay, level three, he kicks, and I counter with the same leg. He kicks. Level four, he kicks, and I kick. No, let's start here first. Simultaneous underneath. That's level four. Level five, he kicks, and I keep coming in with more than one thing. So again, I can start here, or I can block it, counter, but I finish off there like that and move off the angle. Kicks here, move off, one, two. He kicks here, move away, uh, inside, move away. And I make sure I come back with three or four techniques. That'll do. Yes. So that's the leg conditioning drill that we've been using in the dojo since day dot. William Oliver is my sensei. Wow, that's so cool. Uh, I knew a lot of William Oliver's friends and students, but um, I wasn't at the first world tournament. I was at the second and third, fourth, fifth, et cetera, but I didn't meet uh, him. Yeah, he was... Uh, he was a real highlight of the first world tournament. It was very sad when he passed away. That's really interesting to know, David. Thanks for letting me know that. Um, are you still in Brooklyn? Because I have a friend, Raul Dueño. He teaches in Brooklyn now. Uh, anyway, so let's go back so you can see my face. So anyway, they're the five main sturdiness drills that we use, and you can ramp them up absolutely no end to where you are absolutely smashing into kicks, smashing into the legs, smashing the body, everything. Of course, it just depends on uh, your level of experience and conditioning. Okay. Um, the other areas, um, so you've got flexibility, you've got strength. Um, some of these, I'm going to finish right on four today, so bear with me. Good on you. Good to see you, Daniel. Some of these uh, somatics or physical qualities impact on the others more significantly. And the one from what I can see that impacts most on all the others is flexibility. And like I said, if you have a look at the um, Olympic athletes and so on, when you watch their range of motion in anything that happens, the flexibility is very often the determining factor. Okay. Uh, whereas strength... And also flexibility is, is um, along with strength, it's very, very general in nature, whereas cardiovascular endurance, for example, uh, is very specific. So if you can win the Tour de France because you have that incredible stamina on a bicycle, but you, can, you can't run to save yourself. So cardiovascular endurance is very specific. Of course, you have foundation. We used to do a lot of road work and things like that. I'm not too sure that road work is the answer. It was for us back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but um, it's very important that you differentiate between uh, long, slow cardiovascular endurance and cardiovascular endurance that's very specific to fighting, which is usually for fighting anyway, um, you, you want to use um, anaerobic threshold training. If you're not sure what that is, just look it up. Anaerobic means non 
no oxygen or without oxygen and anaerobic threshold training. So it means you're conditioning your body and mind to get used to being on the edge of being without oxygen. And you know that that's the case in tournaments. Um, guys run out of juice in tournaments uh, all the time. And, uh, and uh, if you focused your training in the right way so that you're working on the anaerobic threshold training, it would make a big difference to what you're doing. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, the speed work. Well, uh, absolutely, speed work is vital for um, tournament fighting. Uh, one of the easiest ways to change your mindset towards speed is everything you do, you do sharply and with speed. Even in basics, it becomes like that um, ECG readout. If you have a second and a half between counts, it's neat. So you don't fill the time up available with the technique that you have. It's me. Hum, hey, like this. What you do is itch, meet, sun, heat. So you have to, it's like an ECG. It's not, boy, oh, you hang around here going slow. You you go, ba -ba, ba -ba. you want to try and maximize the time of total rest in between. And that will do the anaerobic threshold training for you because that will force you to use the fast twitch fiber. Fast twitch fiber uh fatigue very quickly because they don't have the same level of oxygen supply, which is caused by the lack of uh, the um, oxygen producing cells in those fibers. Okay. They, they don't have as many as the, uh, as the um, uh, endurance of slow twitch fibers. Now, the next thing, of course, is nutrition. I don't want to go too much into nutrition because, again, you can go to a library and there's whole rows of books on nutrition. But it's very important that you understand at least fundamentally uh, your nutrition. Whether you eat meat or not is a personal choice up to you, but there are certain things you have to understand. We have micronutrients, macronutrients, and I have a thing I call nanonutrients. That's just my word to describe the nutrients that you need that don't supply any nutrition. So in other words, good fresh air, good breathing, good clean, pure water, plenty of sunlight. And to me, they're what I call the nanonutrients. The, the nanonutrients are, you have micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals that you need, trace minerals, vitamins, all that sort of stuff. You have the macronutrients, which are, are your carbohydrates, uh, fats, fatty acids, and proteins, and understanding the role they play and the timing that they play in your training is very vital. It can make such a big difference if you just introduce certain habits, for example, of having a protein shake immediately after training. And things like this are very, very valuable to, to study. So you can look at um, uh, nutrition for athletes. Problem is there's just a thousand different approaches. Okay, And then you add on what I call the nanonutrients, which is Pure fresh water, uh, clean air, and uh, lots of sunlight. Did you ever meet? Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. And it, people may realize Sonny Chiba passed away uh, recently. Uh, he was 80 years old. He played Masayama in the movies about Masayama. He was also a legit Kyokushin third dan. Um, I met him in 1976. He played the movies about Masayama in 1975 and in 76. So his movies were a big hit then. So at the 8th All Japan Championship in 1976, uh, he was there along with uh, a female actor who was in the movies named Shiomi Etsuko. And Sunny Chiba, Shiomi Etsuko were there. I didn't know who they were necessarily, um, but I got on well with them because I was interpreting for everybody at the... Um, at the Sayonara party, especially. And then when I went back to high school, um, you know, I was going to high school in Japan. When I went back to high school and I showed everyone photos of Sonny Chiba and Shiomi, Shiomi they go, no, you've got photos of Shiomi Etsuko. They couldn't believe it, you know, and I didn't know who they were. Yeah, so Sonny Chiba played Masayama in the movies about Masayama. Yeah, and he also, he was a legit, legit fighter. He fought in a team's event. 
in Hawaii, um, North America versus Japan, and he won his fight with a knockout. Uh, Shiro Moshigeri. Cannot use traditional making wire here in Florida due to the ground is too sandy. Would you recommend the sandbag set up over cutting tire in half a round? You, you experiment, Ken, but that works too. Another thing you might do is I don't know what the trees are like in Florida, but in Australia we have what we call the Melaleuca tree, which is very soft on the outside, very hard on the inside. And so um, that makes a really good makiwara, uh, the, the um, Melaleuca tree. So what you want to do, Ken, is go to a local park and just feel the trees. And if they're too hard to hit, obviously you'll just damage your knuckles. But if you can find a tree that actually is soft enough so that you can yeah, you have to be careful all the time, even with um, even with melaleuca trees, or paper bark trees, they're called colloquially. Um, you have to be careful because there's there's uh, veins of hardness. But when you find your tree and keep working on that tree, trees are really really good. And if it's sandy, you may find that some of the trees actually are quite soft, Ken. But uh, the ground a sandbag set up over cutting a tire. Anything you want to do, tires work well. I like the idea of a sandbag, and you could add it to a tire 100%. But I would even get some building scaffolding and make up an A-frame, simply make an A-frame, put a couple of things across, hang the bag on one and rest it on the other, and there you have a really good makiwara. So anyway, folks, thank you very much once again. I appreciate Sean. He's been very patient. Let's he trains with me up the mountain. He's coming along really well. Um, and I appreciate him coming along today and helping me to show you those five uh, sturdiness conditioning drills. Appreciate your time, everybody. Uh, I have some really exciting news too. Uh, and that is that I'm working with some people on a an app. Okay. And my vision is that I'm going to make the best uh Kyokushin martial arts training app in the world. And so I'm looking for five to 10 people who'd like to subscribe to it. I'm going to probably, I haven't priced it yet, but probably it'll be about the same as what I par, a charge for a month training. So if you think about it, you, you pay for a month's training and you, you can come along four or five sessions, right? Mm. Between the dojos. Yes. Whereas with this app, that's a week. Yeah, that's a week. Yeah. Uh, with the app, you have 24 and 7 access. So you can train every single day, morning and night. The app will address Shingi Tai. It'll address all the, the things that I spoke about today. And it'll also give a lot of information for instructors. It'll give small 15-minute packages that you can adopt into your classes. Uh, and those 15-minute packages will be based on different types of conditioning and different types of, of technical training. So anyway, I'm looking for five to ten people uh, who would like to be a founding subscriber, um, probably around 127 Australian a month. And I'm going to work with the founding members and not just give you what I think you need, but also get your feedback so that we can really genuinely zero in on what it will take to make the best app possible. So if you think... Uh, you'd like to be one of those five to 10 founding members uh, who'd like to sign up and help me establish this um, training app, then send me an email. My email is that. Uh, that'd be great. Good on you, Brad. Us. Hi, Kyle. Kyle's actually, uh, I want, I've, I've been, you've been on my head for the last three days, Kyle, going to give you a call, but I never know when I can, call you. Kyle's actually an app maker, but, but I want to talk to him about this app that I'm developing in a different way. But anyway, um, I'll give you a yell sometime, Kyle, because I didn't... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's ironic you're here because the last person in the world I wanted to find out that I'd built an app without them being involved is Kyle because he's a very loyal, very long-term friend who's helped me over the years in many ways. But I'll talk to you about it um, anyway. But by all means... Thank you, everybody. Us, appreciate you coming along. Us. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you uh, got something out of it. And please leave a comment, leave a message. If you haven't signed up, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, pass the word out, and uh, help me get to um, 7 million 
subscribers. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to be a movie star now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's 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 just launched his movie career. Um, Gaza, with his hairs combed or not combed, makes no difference. Thank you, everybody. Us. See you soon.